Good morning, everybody, and welcome on this fourth Sunday in Advent. And I have noticed that uh, the matches are proving difficult for people, so um, I thought, I haven't lit the candles for a while. And uh, remember, the, the first candle, we think about the patriarchs, seeing that one day the blessing for and for and people and rule of god would come and the second candle thinking about the prophets or how they saw that the coming king would come and how isaiah saw that the suffering that the, the coming king would actually be the suffering messiah and then john the baptist who saw both that we'd have to turn from sin and that jesus was that promised suffering Messiah. And then today, the Virgin Mary. And she realized that pride would have to fall before God and that those who trust in God will be saved. Blessed are those who humbly believe what the Lord says. Our Advent witnesses all had faith in God's promises. Will we have faith in God's promises? Well, every day is the day to give our hearts, that is, our love and our praise to God. And so we're going to sing, Come, now is the time to worship. time to
just as you are before your God. Come, come. Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning, we want our hearts to be more full of love for you. Please, would you strengthen, guide us, teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And we have our congregational reading now from Isaiah chapter 40. It's telling us, or telling the people of God, to get ready. God is coming. Flatten the mountains. Humanity is going to perish, but God's word is forever. But when God comes, he will tend his people. So we're reading from Isaiah chapter 40, from verses 1 to 11. And you might like to join me this morning, the other way around. Join me in the odd-numbered verses and then I'll speak the even-numbered verses. So, comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness... Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord flows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. So with the Lord, you're safe, even with the the way humanity doesn't last. We're coming now to remember that uh, though, though we deserve to perish, God tends his people like a sheep. We join together in confessing our sins. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be that we may do justly. Love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs 
in his arms and carries them close to his heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his work that brings us like lambs into your arms. We praise you for the confidence we have in him. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning our theme is, What is God Like? And we're going to consider that, starting in particular with John 1, which you'll find on page 1063. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So before we uh, look at uh, that Bible reading and uh, indeed other scriptures, um, let us uh, commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Our God and Father, I do pray that you will guide me in what I say, and I pray that you will guide us all as we listen to the, the meaning of your word. And uh, we do thank you for this time of year, for Christmas, uh, uh, for the meaning of Christmas. We thank you for sending your son into this uh, broken and sinful world. So please guide us uh, as we ponder the meaning of this Bible reading. In Jesus' name, amen. So the, uh, the title of this uh, sermon is... is uh, what is God like? And uh, we shall be uh, looking at this and uh, let's get the gizmo working. <laughs> oh, that didn't work. Oh, it did. It did. Delayed reaction. Uh, so we're looking at under four headings, which are um, uh, the first uh, thing is uh, um, is why is light essential? Introductory thought there. Uh, and then uh, we'll be looking very briefly, a whirlwind tour through the Old Testament, the divine revelation to Israel. So what do we learn about God from how he revealed himself to Israel? And uh, then the third uh, heading is, uh, who or what is the divine word? And then finally, what is John 1, verses 1 to 4, telling us about God. So, uh, introductory thought here, uh, that light is essential. And I shall uh, share a little story with you, a little simple story, really. Um, but uh, many years ago, I, I lived uh, in a Lakeland Valley with my family. Uh, and one winter evening, I decided to walk to a friend's house. So I, I left the light of our house as I walked uh, down the driveway into the darkness, but then encountered a problem. I couldn't see anything. So it was a cloudy night, and there was no moon. And even worse, uh, contrary to people who live in suburbia, of course, uh, even worse, there were no street lights. And so all I could see was darkness. And if I walked any further, I would uh, stumble into a hedge or bump into a wall or stumble over a stone. Um, it was all looking very hazardous. So I, I did the only uh, sensible thing, which was turn back, uh, ret uh, return to the house, pick up a torch, and then proceed safely 
with my journey. So the torch provided illumination and helped me to get to my destination. And so too with the life of faith. Jesus tells us uh, that Jesus Christ is the source, isn't he, of our spiritual illumination for all of us. He is the light of the world. Trust in Jesus, and he's like a torch guiding us in paths of righteousness. Walk away from him, and the light diminishes, and eventually we, found, we find ourselves surrounded by darkness. It is as simple as that. But I am getting ahead of myself, and so let us have a look at what is God like divine revelation to Israel. So historically, Israel were God's chosen people and had received light from him. Jesus says in John 4, verse 22, that salvation is from the Jews. Now this is in contrast to the gross superstitions and errors of the surrounding nations who worshipped inanimate objects. Uh, such as wooden poles or images of animals. Ancient rulers uh, were no better, like Nebuchadnezzar and many others. They overreached their authority and gave themselves divine status. Even worse, on one occasion, Israel lost the plot and worshipped the image of a golden calf. So everybody, you could say, in the Old Testament times, seemed to be getting it wrong. Now, by contrast, the truth about God, the one true God, is that he is almighty beyond our comprehension. He exists far above and beyond the created world, and yet he is also free to intervene within it. The prophet Isaiah said that the Lord looks down upon the inhabitants of the world and he laughs at them because they look to him as though they are puny grasshoppers. This is like the the proud empires of the world. And the Lord says, they are puny to me. This is the God who scripture says, rides on the wings of the wind and who the psalmist says, that he touches the mountains with his little finger and they smoke. So God, he touches a mountain with a little finger. Oops, I've set off a volcano. Uh, Such is God's power. And uh, the letter to the Hebrews says that our God is a consuming fire. Have you ever thrown wet wet leaves onto a hot bonfire and seen them sucked in? and disappear within seconds with a menacing whoosh. Wow, that was a bit frightening. Better keep my distance from that. No wonder the people of Israel were trembling and pleaded with Moses at Mount Sinai not to compel them to go up the mountain to meet with God. But that is not the full picture, is it? And and as we've been singing this morning, and yet Israel were his chosen people. They were God's chosen people. True, Israel had a God problem, but God had chosen them. They were his treasured possession, enjoying his patronage, love, and protection. He is eternal. He is God from everlasting to everlasting. We live in time and space. We are born, and after a span of time, we die. We may have illusions that we're semi-divine, simply because with modern technologies, we can live a longer span of time, and the crisis of death is delayed, but the pattern is basically the same. We live, we are born, we live a life, and then we die. God is not like that. God has no beginning, no end. 
or succession of moments in which he exists. He sees all time equally vividly, and yet he sees events in time and can act in time. So you could say, God, he, he, uh, he can have the cake and he eats it. <laughs> he, uh, he's eternal, but he's perfectly capable of intervening in time in one place at a certain point in time. He can do both things. We can't do that at all. These things are beyond our reach. It would be like asking a goldfish to, to, to uh, enter into the full knowledge of God for us would be like asking a, a goldfish to solve a rubric cube or a, a donkey to learn musical harmonies or a bat to learn how to design a rocket and fly it to the moon. These things are just not possible. And yet, God through Jesus says he wants us to have a share in his eternal kingdom. What's all that about? We perhaps are somewhat challenged to take this on board and take in the full implications of what this means. What can be done about this puzzling state of affairs? How can this vast chasm between the divine and the human, man in his sin, God in his holiness. How can that vast chasm be bridged? Enter stage, the eternal word. What, who or what is the eternal word? The Greek word for that in, uh, in, the, in this gospel is logos. And that was a John is, is using a term here that was frequently used by the Greeks. He's coining a Greek, uh, uh, a Greek ter uh, terminology. The word or logos was frequently used by the Greeks. It denotes the thought or reason which existed within a person or the communication of his thinking in speech. Philosophically, the Logos represented something like the soul of the universe. It was the all-pervading principle, the rational principle of the universe. It was the creative energy and source of all reality. And yet, this term word was also easily accessed by John's Jewish readers, because in Genesis 1, the word is God's creative speech during the six days of creation. Again and again, it says that God commanded and the different elements of creation came into existence. God spoke and it happened. The word is the agency of God's will. When God speaks, he does something. It is divine action. So bearing all this in mind, uh, let me take us through the opening clauses of John 1. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning, the first words of the Bible in Genesis 1. John is writing about a new beginning, a new creation. So he uses words which recall the first creation. In the first creation, the Lord creates us with a stunning, uh, he creates us with a stunningly beautiful universe to live in, crammed full of delights. And here in John 1, the theme is God's new creation, where the eternal word Logos becomes a flesh and blood human being like us, as the Nicene Creed puts it, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And looking ahead to verse 14 of this chapter, it says, the word, remember what we've been saying about the word, the essential principle of the universe and all the rest of it, the word became flesh, and made his dwelling 
among us. Both creations reveal God as one who makes himself known and provides for us abundantly. He is the giving God. He asks nothing from us except that we turn away from darkness and look to him to provide us with illumination. Is that really too much to ask from us? And the word was God. So uh, somewhat uh, start, imagine how surprising this would have been to the first readers of this gospel. This would have been somewhat startling uh, that, 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 that there's just another one, another person alongside God Almighty. So the word is now described as having equal standing and authority with Almighty God. So we are talking about the ultimate source of reality here, what God is like in himself. The whole existence of the word is orientated towards God the Father. So this speaks of fellowship and closeness uh, of relationship. There is a sense of belonging, nearness and movement between the Father and the Son within the Godhead. And you may be thinking to yourself, what has this got to do with me? <laughs> and this sense of intimacy and fellowship, this is the answer to that question, is, 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 uh, is that uh, this sense of intimacy and fellowship is not something that God wants to keep to himself as if he is inaccessible to us and shut off in heaven like some sort of private members club where we're kind of, sorry, mate, you're not allowed in there. That's not his attitude to us at all, is it? because he reaches out to us in Jesus and desires to have a relationship with us. Now that, I put to you, is good news. And the word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. Now this uh, is clearly stating that Jesus Christ is a full disclosure of deity. When we ask what God is like, we do not need to look at anything beyond what is revealed in the human Jesus. There's not a, a, a something else, a little extra beyond Jesus, which will tell us something more important about God. And as if to completely emphasize that and to make that absolutely crystal clear to all of us verse 3 says that nothing that was created nothing was created without Jesus's involvement in it now he may in his human life have had blood flowing through his veins fallen asleep when he was tired he was furious with the temple money changers. He wept over Jerusalem and he died when hung on a cross. These are all very human things. But he is completely different from us, on the other hand, in his origins, person and sinlessness. So the real message of Christmas and uh, I say this in passing because uh, the, the very fact that you are here, I'm sure you know this anyway, but the real message of Christmas, perhaps we need to get this out, <laughs> out to other people, is not about reindeer, turkey, and Christmas trees, enjoyable as they are, but about Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, God revealed in human flesh. And so now I shall say a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Blessed be God, who in his love stooped down to redeem a broken humanity. Blessed be the king who made himself poor to enrich the needy. Blessed be the holy child who was born of the Virgin Mary. 
Blessed be the eternal word who was made flesh for us. Blessed be Jesus, our Saviour and Lord, now and forever. Amen. The eternal word made himself nothing, and we speak of that in our statement of faith from Philippians this morning. Would you please stand? Let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Well, every voice in the beginning, we're now going to be declaring that Jesus is Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord. The Word was with God. The Word was God. We sing together. Seating for your own From each tribe and tongue and nation You are leading sinners home You're the author of creation You're the Lord of every man And your cry of love rings out Across the lands You're the author of creation you're the Lord of every man And your cry of love rings out across the lands Would you 
Would you please be seated? And we're going to have a film uh, just now. It's from Tear Fund because at the carol service this evening and then on Christmas Day, our offering will be for Tear Fund. And so let's uh, prepare ourselves by reminding us of the work of Tear Fund. 2,000 years ago, a tremor in the neighborhood, a strange rumor, a spark in the night. Love had arrived, word into flesh, divine light manifest in skin and blood and bone, an unfolding of the great redemption plan as earth and heaven fused together. God with us, then and always. The divine became an infant and the infant grew into a rabbi and the rabbi proclaimed a message that would shake and shape the world. Love changes everything. Love is the greatest command. Love is the highest call, and love is the foundation of reality. Love God, love your neighbor. On these commands hang everything. But who, rabbi, is our neighbor? A man on a long and lonely road, sudden violence, left for dead. Two supposedly holy men walk on by. Then, the stranger, the unexpected, the Samaritan. To be a neighbor is to have mercy. To be a neighbor is to have compassion. And to be a neighbor is to reach out to people in need, whoever and wherever they are, whoever and wherever you are. To be a neighbor is to shine a light in the darkness. 2,000 years later, there is darkness stalking the land. Creation is groaning, the violence of climate chaos. Many are being left for dead. Look to Bangladesh, land of a thousand rivers, land of 166 million people right in the path of the climate storm. Who, Rabbi, is our neighbor? A woman, Juliet, proud mother of two beautiful children, carer for a sick husband and pillar of the community, living in fear, living with monsoon and cyclone and flood. Disaster is with us, she says. Crops washed away, animals killed, contaminated water spreading disease, and every year it gets worse. But love changes everything. The church is here, hope is here. Communities brought together to prepare, to strengthen and to empower. Love made manifest in the form of search and rescue teams, first aid training, safer housing, food distributed to the most vulnerable, clean water secured for all, soap and sanitizer safeguarding against disease. In the face of future storms, Juliet's mind and heart and soul are being put at ease. She is one of millions. Who, Rabbi, is our neighbor? 2,000 years later, we can be the spark in the night. We can make sure that love arrives again. This Christmas, we invite you to join us because poverty isn't God's plan. You are. You can be the love that reaches out to people in need. This Christmas, we invite you to embrace faith and hope and love. And we invite you to believe. the 6.30 p.m. carol service tonight. The collection will be for Tear Fund and again the 11 o'clock service on Christmas Day. There will be a 3 o'clock service on Christmas Eve, the nativity service in here. Uh, Barbara Farrah would be prepared to take anyone who would like to to Alan Isherwood's funeral tomorrow which is at 12.15 at Stockport Crematorium. I'm going to now lead us in praying the collect and then 
Anne Wilcox is leading us in our prayers. Eternal God, as Mary waited for the birth of your son, so we wait for his coming in glory. Bring us through the birth pangs of this present age to see with her our great salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The theme of our prayers this morning is the two L things, love and light. A few moments ago, the Tear Fund video reminded us that our neighbours are not just the person next door, but anyone who is in need. With climate change, the needs of the world increase. Drought, flood, disease, starvation, Unstable political situations are all contributing to the norm, enormous problems of our world. But we can ensure that love for our neighbour, all of them, changes everything. Poverty is not part of God's plan. We are. We invite you to believe that. We can reach out with love to those in need as we support Tear Fund this Christmas. So, an Advent prayer from Tear Fund. Dear God, please be close to us in this time of waiting and uncertainty. We cast our fears on you. Comfort, sustain and guide us. Help us to look outside ourselves and draw strength from you to support others. We pray for protection for people around the world especially those living in poverty. Protection from coronavirus, and especially the new Omicron strain. As countries take measures to slow its speed, we pray for the provision, pray to God for provision of food, shelter, and health care for the people who have no safety net to fall back on. Give us love for all our neighbours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our Bible passage this morning, we were reminded that Jesus came to bring God's light into a world of deep darkness. So as we continue in prayer, let us pick up on that theme of light. In response to the words, in this season of light, please add, be light for the world, for the, for the world, sorry. In this season of light, be light for the world. In this season of gifts, we celebrate your coming as the only gift we really need as we enjoy the surprises and imagination of those who give us presents, may the child in the straw be the gift that really overwhelms us. And may our giving to others flow from hearts motivated by gratitude for your glorious gift. In this season of light, be light for the world. In this season of family gatherings, we celebrate your coming to be part of a human family. As we experience the delights and the frustrations of family life this Christmas, may the child in the straw be the still life that holds us all together. And may our care for each other reflect your profound care for us all. In this season of light, be light for the world. In this season of memories, we celebrate our corporate memory of your arrival in the darkness, a sharp cry in the night air, animals shuffling nearby, rough shepherds from the hills, a star, 
strange visitors from the East. And our own individual memories take us back to distant times of greater innocence and less cluttered lives, of other relationships and different places. May the child in the straw be the continuity that we need, the thread of gold that holds past and present in a single story. In this season of light, be light for the world. In this season of peace, we celebrate peacemakers who listen to the angel's song and seek to bring peace to your people on earth. And yet we stand on the vulnerable edge of violence in many parts of the world. Especially we remember the Middle East and all areas of war and terror. May the child in the straw be a reminder of another way and a greater light, one that unites every race under heaven. In this season of light, be light for the world. In this season of hope, we celebrate your coming like the dawn after a long night. As we struggle with our personal darkness, the issues and conflicts, the temptations and confusions, so may the child in the straw draw us into a larger and safer space where complexity dissolves into simplicity and your light shines forever. In this season of light, be light for the world. Lord of light, you've drawn us out of darkness into your glorious light. We come to you afresh this Christmas time, longing for a new start and another chance. Take our Christmas celebrations and fill them with golden, glowing hope to sustain us through the coming year. We ask this in the newborn name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let's com continue and conclude our prayers with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of now and forever. Amen. That fourth candle today, that candle to do with the Virgin Mary, blessed are those who humbly believe what the Lord says. We're going to join now in singing a version of Mary's song. She had faith in God and believed God's word. Would you please stand? Tell her, my soul, the greatness of the Lord. Unnumbered blessings give my spirit voice tender to me. The promise of His word in God, my Savior, shall my heart rejoice. Tell out my soul the greatness of his name. Make known his might, the deeds his arm has done, his mercy sure. From age to age the same, his holy
and sisters said the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>